Welcome back to another episode of The Political Life. Today, we are going to bring you another guest from Denver, from NCSL. We're actually no longer at NCSL. We have left, and my uh, guest, uh, Rachel Stern of InState Partners, which is part of Advantage Capital, uh, and we'll talk about that in a bit. She was at NCSL, and she is now back um, at the world headquarters in Napa Valley. Uh, actually, they're based in Washington, D.C., but she is in Napa. And um, we were uh, I was having lunch with uh, Steve Palmer of Forbes Tate. And um, as we were coming out of the restaurant, um, which, by the way, they did not have a seat available and, until Steve started talking to him. And, and then he, he got us a table. There were no reservations, apparently. But as we were walking out and stopping every 10 feet to... Uh, talk to someone that Steve Palmer uh, would bump into. We bumped into Rachel Stern, and uh, that is how she ended up uh, coming uh, on the show today. And so we're so happy to uh, have her, and we have to um, pause here, and uh, we're going to have to wish Steve Palmer good luck because in a couple of weeks, he is doing the Leadville 100-mile race in the mountains of Colorado, which are not very small mountains. They're, they're quite large. And uh, it's a and and you didn't hear that incorrectly. That is a 100 mile race. You can Google it. The Leadville 100. David Goggins has done it, and many other people. Uh, and it's quite incredible. Steve has done it before. Uh, he's doing it again. Uh, and so we wish him all the best. And it was great seeing him in uh, in Denver and hearing about all of, uh, their work at Forbes Tate. And today we bring you uh, Rachel. Rachel Stern, welcome to the show. Thank you. Most decidedly not running a hundred miles <laughs> unless chased. <laughs> um, and even so, then, I'm not sure. And I even then, push. and even then probably not making it over that finish line. And, you know, Steve getting a table at a totally booked restaurant doesn't surprise me at all because, you know, good lobbyists show up in all sorts of ways, right? He yeah. was a man who, who had a mission and he got it over the finish line. He, uh, it was very funny. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was great to see him and, and he, uh, he, uh, uh, obviously he came down to, uh, NCSL, but he lives right outside of Denver. So he was just popping in and out, I think. Um, but yeah, it was great to see him. And, uh, so Rachel, let's start off. Uh, well, first of all, for our listeners, we had interviewed Alex Johnson of InState Partners a couple of years ago, and it was really a great interview. And I went into the interview fairly cold, so I could learn about in-state partners um, during the interview. And it was really a great discussion uh, about in-state partners and how they came to be and how they're uh, part of Advantage Capital and kind of what they do. So I would encourage people to go back and listen to that episode also. Uh, and then today we're going to dive in a little bit more uh, with Rachel. So Rachel, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. And Hopefully, we'll provide some, you know, good context and new content around Alex's interview. I, you know, I think he covered a fair amount of our inception story. But, you know, in the last two years in the pandemic, so much has changed and grown and evolved. And um, I really feel like we're much more clear in our mission and, and grounded in how to get there than we were even, you know, 18 months or 24 months ago. So excited to be here. Tell us uh, about NCSL. Did you, um, uh, why were you there? And uh, did you, uh, was it successful for you? It was successful. This was our first year uh, not formally attending the conference. We've been sponsors in the past and this year decided to see what it was like sort of from the outside. And there's so much, you know, excellent networking opportunities and clients in town and lobbyists in town and, and legislators in town. It's, it's such an old home week, really, wherever it is. So I use that week really to reconnect with um, folks that I work with on a contract basis in states that I don't get to very often. Um, I use it to see clients. IndieGov was there. I, I know you interviewed Alex Kutz not so long ago. And um, legislators, right? Thinking about session, thinking about what is on the priority list, you know, in years like this, thinking about who is up for election and, and what their priorities are. It's just such a great way. 
get all of that content in one place and really use your days efficiently and effectively, which would normally take weeks on the road to, to gather. So um, always a great event. Got to go to the Colorado State Night and, uh, you know, got to see Meow Wolf, which was by far the trippiest reception I've ever been to. Right. It's, it's unusual to see legislators with their name tags wandering through what is essentially a you know acid trip manifested. Um, so it was, it was certainly a, a novel experience, uh, and it was, it was a really great week. That's great. And you're right. It is, um, it, uh, and when I think we saw you, you were having lunch with your Texas lobbyist. Yes. Danielle Delgadillo, who is, um, one of my oldest friends and mentors, actually, she was working at Advantage Capital when I started here and then went out and hung her own shingle down in Austin and has spent a bunch of time back and forth between Austin and Napa. And so it's always such a treat to catch up with her and hear what's happening in that great state um, that, you know, isn't making it into the news, but is being said behind closed doors. And um, I always feel like I leave with a better grasp on just, you know, how incredible and crazy and big and amazing and sometimes terrible Texas is. <laughs> <laughs> it is just big. like all the states. Yeah. Um, and uh, IndieGov, actually, we're going to have to have uh, Alex back on. We had Alex on, I think, a year ago. Uh, and it was fascinating. And since then, they've gotten additional funding. Um, yes. And I know and I know you all are investors uh, in IndieGov. How Alex, uh, we'll have to have him back on. They, they must, they, it sounds like things are going like gangbusters. Well, we're working on it, right? So, so IndieGov is a great example of a company that's in our portfolio where, you know, we are really strategic investors more than anything, right? We'll, we'll invest some capital, but also we invest our time and our resources and our network and our ability to help them grow into markets that would otherwise take them a long time without the right relationships. Um, we are extremely bullish on, on that project and that team and that CEO. You, I have been so amazed to see legislators' eyes light up every time we give the pitch, right? This idea that you could streamline a process that is so integral to their job, but so hard to manage is mm -hmm. one of, honestly, one of the best parts of my job and, and working with companies like IndieGov to really identify problems on a state and local level and come to them with technology solutions that solve for that, right? Like what an incredible opportunity for partnership and growth on both sides. Yeah, it was really, I really enjoyed interviewing him and hearing his story. Um, and so we, uh, we will have to have him, uh, have him back on now. Tell us about some of your, uh, other interesting, um, investments and actually for our listeners who, uh, maybe don't remember, aren't familiar. Why don't you give the, the little elevator speech or give us in-state partners in a nutshell? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, in-state partners is a business line within advantage capital, which is a private equity firm that works across the country to bring capital and investment into geographic areas that typically don't have access to it by utilizing state and federal tax credits. Now, they had developed this incredible network of contract lobbyists to create these programs. And so when I started there in 2013, they were really trying to figure out you know, how do you take this incredible network and maybe monetize it outside of legislative sessions? So um, at 22, I was a Coral Fellow. I was placed at Advantage Capital for a month. And my project was to come up with a business plan to see if there was any sort of viable opportunity uh, to sell a network like this and sell a mind share and, and sell a vision of what it looks like to have a national presence for companies that may or may not have access to it. And so after an initial Google search of what is a business plan and how do you write one, uh, you know, in-state partners was born. Uh, the name was literally <laughs> drummed up on the back of a napkin at Roberta's Brooklyn pizza house, uh, where I was visiting a friend from college. And really it was a scrappy grounds up, you know, opportunity to build something, but with a safety net of a parent company behind me as my mother said, you know, giving me healthcare benefits. They were, they couldn't explain what I did, but they were thrilled I had insurance. So I, I, and, and from there we really built this tool that was used 
and became primarily used by technology companies of many sizes, right? So we worked with the Lyft team when it was Chris Massey and Katie Kincaid and Veronica Juarez. And, you know, they felt very covered on the coast, but had no idea what was going on in 22 states, right? Or couldn't, didn't have the internal capacity to cover it themselves. And we really sort of made a name for ourselves in these emerging disruptive technology spheres in the early days where there were teams that were, you know, not sleeping at all, spending all their time on the road, trying to create new regulatory structures that, that disrupted uh, existing, existing things like taxis and really helping them scale quickly and efficiently using our relationships, our know-how, and frankly, our teams on the ground in these places that lived and breathed the politics of those states. And so in parallel to sort of working with those big companies, we were also starting to work with emerging technology companies, really early stage. Our first investment was Pay It, that Alex talked a little bit about in his interview. Um, they have gone just in the last three days to announce a $90 million fundraise um, and continued expansion. It's been such a wild ride to be on that with them because when we started, it was John Thompson, the CEO, and and us with an idea, but no product, no relationships, no sales. And, and we really helped them build from the ground up. And we've taken that knowledge share to work with companies like IndieGov um, and others that I'm happy to talk about to say, what if you could scale... 10x faster than your competitors using this relationship network and know-how and, you know, really just mind share of people who have lived and breathed national political campaigns. How do you find your companies, your your investments, like pay it in Indigov? How do they get you know, on the radar? It's, it's really an interesting mix of things. Um, one is word of mouth, of course, where you know, the, there's a huge emerging technology scene in Kansas City right now, so of which Pay It is really a, a nucleus and a poster child. And so a lot of folks come to us through there, um, through some of our contract lobbyists who are seeing interesting companies emerge in their states. Um, mm -hmm. And then we've done partnerships with AWS, for example, larger companies that have really developed a thesis around how emerging gov tech can help expand their footprint while also um, offering, you know, these startups resources that they wouldn't otherwise be able to afford. And so they were so smart to get into this space early and have since created a, a gov tech incubator um, and have a huge portfolio of companies, really every size that they work with. And, and we work with their teams very closely to monitor their pipeline and sort of see which companies are, are right for the picking, right? It's not all companies are ready for our services. There are some companies that are just too early days and, you know, don't necessarily have the vision or don't necessarily have the funding or, or even, you know, don't necessarily understand how state and local government will come into play for them yet. And so we, we wait for the ones that are ready to fundraise, ready to scale quickly, um, and have teams that are just, you know, knock your socks off good and could go build a billion dollar unicorn anywhere, but really have focused on solving government problems. And then when you get a potential <clears throat> Indigov or pay it um, comes uh, and, and you begin, they come on your radar, what's the process internally to evaluate them? Does Advantage Capital have uh, a number of people that can help do that? How do, what's the internal process like? Because it must it must be hard to determine which ones to do and which ones not to do. That's exactly right. And we've spent a lot of time really since the pandemic thinking about how you compare apples and apples with GovTech startups, right? Because you are, or we are really picking a horse in multiple verticals, right? We're not going to have multiple drone companies. We're not going to have multiple companies selling to commissioners of workforce or DMVs. And so we are really trying to do our diligence to figure out what the competitive landscape looks like early and often, right? And sometimes there's one very large incumbent in the space that has not been challenged in many years and um, is sort of ripe for the picking because people aren't satisfied, but they don't know the other options. And sometimes mm -hmm. there's no one in the space and government is still sort of starting to recognize they may have may or may not have a problem 
And so it's really balancing those factors. We do have a huge, incredibly capable team of investment professionals as part of the Advantage Capital umbrella. We have a few folks who we pull in on these deals um, very early to get their professional assessment from a financial side, as well as sort of our political assessment on whether or not there's a problem to solve, whether or not the team feels like they can go in and, and sell this thing. Um, and it's that aligning of factors. We have some scoring mechanisms internally where we you know, weigh multiple factors, as any investment professional would, to make sure that we're trying to pick the best and brightest, solving for a problem, have a product that we can actually help sell, um, and also you know, have a product that makes financial sense to our investment professionals. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot of mind share between those two teams, and it's an art that we're really trying to make into a science. As you look at your portfolio, uh, is there one, do you have a favorite child? Oh, you can't say that on, you can't say that on Come the internet, on. Jim. Um, what, what, one honestly, that I, one I that beat your expectations, place. one that surprised you. Uh, I mean, pay it has been such a, a yeah, golden egg true, yeah. for us. But yeah. but yes, I mean, absolutely, there are parts of all of these companies that just totally blow my mind. We're working with a, a company called Merit right now, and they raised. I want to say $50 million last fall, and they've got a digitized credentialing platform. And that really could mean a lot of different things and, and does. And the problems that they're solving for, one is an emergency management, which is how do you track your volunteers and their credentials to ensure that states after a natural disaster are getting full FEMA reimbursement? So how do you digitize those credentials of someone who's been trained by FEMA responding to an incident on the ground, how many hours have they worked, how much reimbursement is the state qualified for. So that's solving for a paper process that happens at midnight every day when people are exhausted trying to count hours and laborers and qualifications. And that was just such a such so ripe for disruption. But this technology can also be used for workforce development. How do you find and track people's development as early as middle school, really, and help build the next generation of workforce to meet the private sector's needs, right? Over and over, we're hearing about all of these challenges around workforce development and having a lot of people who feel like they're being failed by the system and not able to find work that they're qualified for or in industries that maybe are coming to the end of their political days. And how do you retrain them for an economy that has a lot of open jobs but no qualified or skilled workers. And so, so this idea that the private sector can basically create a roadmap of skills that they're looking for and educational institutions, whether it's technical colleges or apprenticeships or community college or universities can help their students meet those qualifications. So there's this really nice pairing and then keeping people within a state, keeping that workforce ecosystem thriving of developing local talent and keeping them there. And all of that is happening through digitized credentials, right? And it doesn't necessarily just have to be, I completed Math 101. It can be, I was an Uber driver for two years and I had a five-star rating, right? What does that say about someone's ability to be in customer service and engage with their surroundings and be on time and all of those sort of soft skills that come with, with all sorts of credentials, I think really will enable a future of workforce and a network effect that we can only picture now, but we're going to absolutely need to move toward. And how many different uh, portfolio companies do you have right now that are active? We've got approximately six right no. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got six right now um, and are looking to add to one or two in the next year, um, have the capacity for it, have the desire for it. And frankly, there's never been more political will to be working with these startups and there's never been more money. So we're really trying to capture lightning in a bottle and pick, you know, a few a few sectors that we think are ripe for disruption, which I've said, but also where do we think that political decision makers, even even different administrations will want to keep that thread of priority, right? So workforce development is a great one. Um, we're working with a company called Semantic AI right now that does a lot of federal work for DOD. They have an incredibly powerful artificial intelligence operation that they are really trying to solve for on the state and local level. 
And one of the things their technology can be used for is helping states track human trafficking across their borders, overlaying all of the data sets that are living separately within departments and between states to sort of a singular pane of glass where states can really be working with the data in front of them to try to solve for this. And that is, that's a universal problem. That's a bipartisan problem. That's a problem that states are going to have no matter who the governor or legislature is. And so those are really the sweet spots for us in terms of finding these companies, because you just have to find a problem that's big enough that everyone wants to solve. What um, and what other uh, sectors do you are on the horizon that, you know, that you're looking at that people, people out in the public may not be thinking about yet, but you are? Sure. Um, Some of the things that I'm getting really excited about are resilience tech. So not even just emergency management, but how do states and cities predict where geographically they're vulnerable? Mm. I live in Napa, California, as you mentioned, um, which I'm sure you've seen has had a small issue with fires in the last, you know, last few years. And as someone who moved from the East Coast, I had no concept of what it was like to live near a fire, but it's terrifying. Right. And mm-hmm. one of my biggest pain points, and if someone wants to go create this, you know, I'll invest it a million times over. But you have to gather your information from a bunch of different sources, right? Cal Fire Twitter is telling you where it is. Google Maps shows a little flame, but doesn't show which road closures there are. Um, you know, there's no way of overlaying purple air, which is giving you air quality with wind direction, right? There, it's impossible to plan. And, and as a, you know, woman in her thirties, I consider myself relatively technologically adept, but my neighbors are in their seventies, right? And, and they are not necessarily going to all of those places or even knowing where to look for that information. And it just leaves everyone at a disadvantage, leaves constituents scared. It leaves government unable to really identify where there are vulnerabilities and it just leaves the system on really shaky ground. So I have never been more passionate about resilience tech and really creating that singular source of truth for natural disasters, whether they're tornadoes or floods or fires, so that constituents can make good choices and government can know where their constituents are and what they need. Um, So that's one I'm very, very bullish on. Along that vein, our 911 systems nationally are a disaster. There are a lot of very old technologies at play there that um, once again leave people at, at a very dangerous disadvantage. This idea that, you know, sometimes I have a 720 number, which is a Denver number, which is where I grew up. Sometimes if I called 911, even from Napa, it would connect me to Denver PD, right? Mm-hmm. That doesn't solve for a problem in Napa. And there's no way to text 911. So if you're in a situation where you can't talk or you're hiding, there's no way to, to get in touch with them through anything other than calling. Right. Mm-hmm. And and that's that's a tremendous lack of, of forethought. Um, and and the fact that you can't location share with 911. Right. Unless, you can with an iPhone a little bit. But the reality is, is that it's very hard for first responders to know exactly where you are. And that comes into play in things like school shootings, which is like, how do you figure out where the shooting is happening? What room? Who's there? Where is everyone else? Right. Th- th- there's just. We live in a world now that requires us to be very technologically connected and the private sector is enabling us to do so. And unfortunately, our emergency services at every level, it it, it doesn't fit into that yet. So really interested in looking for sort of new innovative 911 providers. Um, And, you know, I think drones are really interesting. I think that's a technology like, you know, Lyft and the scooters that is is eventually going to come to a head on a regulatory framework nationally, where do we want drones delivering our groceries? And if so, you know, what does it look like to regulate them? I had PG&E was redoing some lines on our property and I didn't know they were coming. And so a drone flew over my house and it was kind of alarming. (laughs) It was just, you know, it's weird to have this thing flying above you and I was totally powerless to do anything, right? And and so there's just a broader conversation about how we, it's, not, it's unannounced. It's yeah. unannounced. And how do we balance our desire for privacy, if we even do have a desire for privacy anymore, with our desire to have things quickly? Um, and government's going to have to grapple with that. And are you seeing, are there a bunch of um, 
interesting companies jumping into this 911 uh, space that you're looking at? The 911 space, I haven't seen as much. I talked to a company many years ago, but because it it's sort of chicken in the egg where there needs to be a national strategy, but it has to happen on the state level, right? Mm-hmm. Because a 911 service can't be much different in Louisiana than it is from Kentucky, than it is from Colorado. Mm-hmm. People need to know they can call 911 and what they get for it. And they mm-hmm. can't have different expectations where they grew up in Louisiana where you can text 911, but you're in Colorado and you're texting 911 and no one comes, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm not using those states for anything other than an example. I don't know what their specific 911 situations are, but it's one of those things that almost has to happen federally and then be implemented by the states. But I'm actively looking for companies that are solving for that because holy Toledo, right? When you think about it, that feels like one of the most important things we have as a society. Yes, indeed. And so, Rachel, where, um, you know, what does a typical week, typical month uh, look like for you as you're spending your time? So I would say a lot of my days are spent talking to our portfolio companies, helping them develop strategies and follow up. Um, I, I listened to your interview with Michael Nutter, who is a very, very good friend and mentor as well. And he pulled me Mayor aside. Nutter. Mayor Nutter, the, just the greatest. And there's a really funny story actually about him and I being at Joe's Stone Crab in D.C. and the guy sitting next to us turning and saying, has anyone told you you sound exactly like Mayor Michael Nutter? Like I listen <laughs> to that guy every week on CNBC and you just sound exactly like him. And and Mike was wearing a hat. and He was like, oh, that's so, so interesting. Um, and then, you know, went back to eating, went back to eating his chicken. And then finally I couldn't take it anymore. And I said, just so you know, this is, Mayor Nutter. And the guy was like, Oh my God, I'm such a huge fan. This is so cool. And I mean, just being with him is like being with a celebrity all the time. Um, and, and he's the greatest and very early days. We've been working with Mike now for four or five years, really as our, our, our local advisor, right. Both in terms of which cities are most innovative and, you know, interested in some of these technology companies, but also as someone who's been on the government side, on the buying side, and Mm -hmm. what should we be hitting? Um, And I think the thing he pointed out to me very early, and frankly, often, is that a lot of startups don't know how to pitch government. They just don't understand what needs to happen, how it's different from an investor pitch, right? And how, you know, what does their deck need to say? What do their case studies need to say? how do you set an agenda for a government stakeholder call, right? Where you're asking more questions than you're pitching. And how do you navigate the political events? And when and how do you need to engage with state and local lobbyists? And how do you identify key markets? All of these things that we've like sort of soft branded in state academy. And I spend a lot of time with our portfolio companies really working on those basics, right? It's, Mm -hmm. It's not so much, The pitches are great, of course, and getting to those state capitals and getting in front of stakeholders. But I think a lot of our value comes relatively early days in our partnerships where we're working with these companies to say, hold on, this is a totally different market than anything you've been prepared for before. And what do we need to talk about? How are we talking about the problem you're solving? You know, how are you navigating your legal strategy and your media strategy and So it's a lot of internal coaching. And so I spend a lot of my days going through pitches, um, thinking through what case studies we want to highlight and and really doing that sort of advisory element, which I absolutely love. The rest of it is, you know, setting up actual meetings, working with our teams, helping all of our companies manage their multi-state and multi-locality outreach and making sure that follow-up is happening and making sure that You know, someone asked for a digital licensure example. Have we gotten it to them? What does it say? So that's sort of one part of it. Another significant part is finding new companies and talking to new companies. We, I spend a lot of my time working with other venture capital firms who are interested in GovTech, but maybe not focused on it. So Andreessen and Sequoia and all of these big guys that maybe have one or two really interesting GovTech companies as as small bets, but aren't necessarily focused on the industry because they think it takes a long time to monetize. And they think Mm -hmm. it's a painful process, which it is, right? And requires a tremendous amount of patient capital. Um, And so developing our network of other VCs 
to then help us feed feed in deals to our own pipeline because they know that we have the political expertise to help these companies scale. And sort of the third element is is a lot of travel. I spend a lot of time at political mm-hmm. events, whether it be DGA or DLCC or NCSL, um, trying to find those political decision makers and, and do that matchmaking between them and our companies. Um, and did I did you mention you, you said something about a state academy? Did I oh, you? yeah, I, I was saying we soft branded our, you know, beating up of pitches as in state academy. Oh, right? I- when you become a portfolio company, you have to go through these sort of rigorous laps where we just look at everything you've developed so far and beat it to a pulp. Wow. And I love that part that, you know, that that came. I did some um, political campaigns in my early 20s. One is part of Coro, which was a Republican campaign for state treasurer in Missouri. And it was a two person team and then me. And so um, pretty early, I was given like way too much responsibility for a 21 year old. I was suddenly put in charge of finance and speech writing. And um, but I developed a real knack for um, making adult men cry by like locking them in a room and saying, you have to memorize this speech. Like you're not coming out until you've memorized this speech. Um, and it turns out I, you know, that thirst for power stayed with me. Well, and it's, and it has served you well and your clients. The, uh, that sounds, uh, that sounds grueling. I will have to, um, uh, maybe sometime we can, uh, we can do a podcast where we watch one of your portfolio <laughs> companies actually go through the in-state academy. Go through it. Well, and, and Marinette has been so great about it too. We're working on a small sort of conference for pipeline companies next, next fall. And he and I are going to do a little bit of a bit where they do a pitch to me as an investor and they do Mm -hmm. a pitch to him as a political decision maker. And we really highlight the differences. Oh, that's very interesting. Right. Because it's not the same. That would make a good episode. Okay. Well, we can, we can definitely do that. Well, we'd, we'd be happy to do that. And, you know, Mike is so great and he's so funny. He has a, such a quick wit about him that I think, I think it would be an entertaining match because people don't understand that you're not asking the government for money. You're telling them, you're reminding them of a problem that you can solve. Right. And you're trying to get them, different, right. Exactly. You're trying to get them to use the service, not to, and it's one of the biggest problems in that, in, you know, let's say you have a, um, whatever it may be, uh, a service that a city government can use, is the um, RFP process somewhat hindering or their procurement rules? Um, does that hinder you or do you start off small enough where that doesn't really come into play or is it different for different companies? Different for different companies. I mean, I think the RFP process is horrible and hard and long and often necessary Mm -hmm. because I used to get so frustrated with how long the buying process took years and years and years and years often for especially if we were trying to get a first contract for a company like pay it for example where we really started with no traction and had to create that momentum and that burning platform and that traction Mm -hmm. I used to just get I feel like I was banging my head against the wall where people were telling me yes and nothing was moving Um, And as I've gotten older, I've been able to reflect on this reality that government is playing with the house's money to a certain extent. And a mistake has pretty serious implications. As a taxpayer, I do want government to be relatively pragmatic in what they invest in. And, you know, yes, there are a lot of issues, but no, government can't go bankrupt, Um, you know, with a few notable exceptions that we shan't name here. But you know, in general, they have to be very, very conservative. And and as a constituent, I respect that. As an investor in GovTech, it often feels like I'm pulling my hair out for long periods of time. So it depends. It depends on the companies. We like companies that um, have a state and local play for exactly that reason, Jim, because localities can often move faster. Um, mm-hmm. They're smaller contracts and you can get now they're way more work right? There's 5,000 towns and towns right next to each other have different decision makers and different egos and different agendas. And so it's, it's just a lot more work for those dollars. Um, but 
when you can point to real traction, that's nothing but evidence that states should be procuring too. So we like that parallel path. That makes sense. Well, Rachel, this has been fantastic. It was great uh, to meet you out in Denver and uh, great to have you on the podcast so soon after NCSL and here get an update on in-state partners and hear about all that you're doing. Um, so thank you for coming on. Thanks, Jim. Really appreciate you having me and feel like I'm, you know, ma finally made it to the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I've seen all of my, you know, old, old colleagues on here and I'm just thrilled to be here. And, and thanks for the robust conversation. And, you know, you have, you have my email. I'd love to come back. Well, Rachel, thank you so much. And for our listeners out there, remember, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and you can sign up for our email at politicallife.net. And we hope you all are staying safe and staying cool. And we will see you next week.